Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Behind the Mic. I'm your host, Jonathan Hodson, back with another chat with the sportscaster this evening. This week, we have Elisa Bose, longtime sportscaster. You'll know her from her time at TSN, including Sports Center, and she's also covered the 2010 Olympics. Women's hockey tournament has been involved in youth sports and has her own passion project on now the Lucy Tries Sports Children's Book Series that we'll dive into. Really looking forward to this one. We'll retrace her steps a little bit, talk a little bit about what uh, what her path has looked like and and uh, who's helped her along the way, and we'll get into. Uh, what's been um, her second act uh, with the Lucy Trust Sports Project. So we're going to throw it to break one more time, and we'll be right back and bring in Lisa. Thanks for watching Behind the Mic on Amateur Sports TV. Behind the mic on Amateur Sports TV, Jonathan Hodson with you. Thrilled now to bring in our guest for this evening, Lisa Bose. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, Jonathan, here on Amateur Sports TV and the inaugural season. Congratulations. I appreciate that. It's <laughs> been uh, it's been a lot of fun. It, it it's kind of Honestly, it's been pretty humbling to see the the types of people who've uh, been willing to come on and lend their support. And uh, you're you're the next in line. Um, it's it's already been a lot of a lot of fun in the in the lead up to this. So um, I just want to thank you for um, getting behind this so quickly and being so enthusiastic about uh, coming on here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I have a soft spot for amateur sports. And so anything I can do to help support that cause, especially because we don't have those local sports departments like we used to. And so I feel that this is actually a fantastic platform to get so many great stories and athletes out there. Yeah, exactly. And um, that's what really drew me to when I was um brushing up a little bit on, on your work experience. And of course, um, you know, the casual fan will of course know you from TSN and CFL and, and some of the other uh, pro things, but I really um, realized myself in the prep for this, just how deep uh, your connection to ama amateur sports has been um, all the way along um, and just, um, I guess we'll start there with with uh, where that where that comes from and what's the draw for you about being so invested in in the in the amateur side. Well, I think it probably goes back to the fact that I'm a physical education graduate, and when I was at university, I actually played varsity soccer. And like so many of us, right, we grow up in, in grassroots sport. We, we typically, you know, that's how we stay active in our lives. Many times we, we keep that up. Maybe later on now at this stage, right, I'm now into more things like golf <laughs> and hiking and things like that. I, I'm not out on the soccer pitch like I used to be, but I did play that game for, for many, many years. So I think it really does stem back, Jonathan, to the fact that, that I, I grew up with boys uh, where I uh, where I grew up in Guelph, Ontario, our street was full of boys, and I guess that's how I was socialized. It's really kind of helped become part of my identity, being involved in the sport landscape from a very early age. I would say since I was seven, that's when I first started to play soccer with boys, and and then my love of sport just grew, and that's how I ended up wanting to become a gym teacher. And then the next thing I wanted to become once I got to university was to get into sports psychology. And then it all changed when I was approached by the campus radio station. And I know many of our young broadcasters have started right there at a college or university campus radio. Fantastic place. 
to just you know learn the craft and and then I, I changed my degree completely and I graduated up early and went into broadcasting school so I guess you're asking me how did where does that drive come from it comes from the very beginning playing sports loving sports then wanting to work in sports and that's what I've really done my entire life and so when we think about amateur sports and the value of amateur sports what it does for all of us as a culture as a as a country well i just think that those stories are ones that really do need to be told and and in many ways they should also be told on that national stage not always just within the smaller markets some of them are fantastic stories that everybody needs to hear about and we can do that now on a platform such as this and obviously on any social media platform for that matter and it brings to mind a question for me that um, I had lined up, but I guess we'll dive into it right away <laughs> is um, something that I encountered when I was working in college baseball on the team side uh, was like even five years ago, we started to really realize just how much the local sports programming was changing. And it, it hit us like, okay, we have to control our own messaging and our own content because the the local sports landscape is really is really changing how did how have you seen uh the local sports coverage change because that is going to be the bulk of your amateur sports well i can speak to that quite personally uh because that is my last job loss uh, so I was laid off uh, at CTV in Calgary, as were, um, I think there was 18 of us at that time. And so they, the network decided to reimagine the uh, local sports department. And so many of us lost our jobs at that time. And, and I think that's just a reflection of the broader broadcasting uh, landscape of where television, radio, print, the traditional media, where it lies with the social media. And so as a result, I can definitely say to you that, that that was too bad, right? Because we were also going into Lethbridge, a smaller center. And I know Jonathan, you've done work with the Western Major Baseball League, right? And so I can remember that we were bringing those highlights to the people in Southern Alberta. And now that avenue is no longer available. So I used to love telling stories that, that I would never normally tell at, at the network. Uh, and so I do feel sad for many you know, amateur sports and for many of those stories that weren't able to get out through the traditional media, but now they can through social media and platforms. And yes, you're right, teams then had to take on the messaging and there brings in a big question about journalism and objectivity versus subjectivity because if you're controlling the message, right, you're effectively your own promo department, your own television station. And really, we saw that really have an effect in uh, sports broadcasting for sure, when the teams then began to have their own media departments, like Flames TV, Leafs TV. And then it really did change, especially for those of us in the traditional media in terms of access to the players. Yeah, for sure. So we, you talk a little bit about um, growing up and the role of sports early on for you. When did that start to transition into um, into knowing that you wanted to be a sportscaster? Was it a uh, was yeah. it right away, or did you kind of kind of find your way to it in a roundabout way? Well, uh, when I was playing soccer, and I will have to give a a. a I have to say my university, That's Western, <laughs> at, at Western, uh, and I was playing for the Mustangs. And at the time, uh, we were at the athletic banquet. And it's kind of a funny story because uh, we were sitting at the athletic banquet and two students from the radio station, CHRW, were there, Radio Western. And one of them started chatting with me. And he said, you know, we really don't get a lot of the women's sports on the air. So next year, would you be interested in volunteering? And I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. Sure, okay, I could do that. So it kind of started, Jonathan, as a bit of a lark. Remember, I was actually wanting to go into sports psychology. And, and so at the after the game, my teammates, like I, you know, I'd say, Donowski, you know, I was wide open there. Why didn't you see, you know, it was a bit of a lark, right? Having fun with my teammates. 
But then I recognized, and I, I got to drive home from, from university one night with my dad, and I remember him and I having this conversation about how I always enjoyed writing. I did enjoy the drama element in high school, and then I had this love of sport. And he said, you know, there might be something there for you. There. And I thought, you're right. Here I am doing this radio stuff. And so then I actually volunteered for this student newspaper, and I wrote a couple of articles in the Gazette. It was actually indoor field hockey, I remember. And then I also volunteered at Rogers Cable in London, Ontario. So while I was at university working towards a phys ed degree, I was also volunteering and trying to see what medium really attracted me. And it was the TV side. And I even had an opportunity, you'll laugh, and I have no idea where the tape is, and I hope it's, it's, it's in a vault tightly locked away, but I do remember actually taking a stab at boxing play-by-play -play at the Canada Summer Games on Rogers. So some of those opportunities, my goodness, how lucky and fortunate to be able to have some of those while you're a student looking towards a degree. And so then I went to broadcasting at Conestoga in Kitchener, Ontario, and that actually then led to my journey to TSN. So I graduated up early and completely shifted gears. And that's life, right? That's our journey. You head one way, ooh, this is interesting, and then you go that way. And, and that's really life, isn't it? It's a roller wow. coaster, it's switchbacks, it's, and it's wonderful to have the journey. Now, it brings to mind a story that I was told by my day one mentor in baseball, uh, Jerry Howarth from oh. the Florida Blue Jays. Yeah. He would tell me the story about being in school, dreaming of being a big time writer. And he had friends in the, in the broadcast side of things at school. And so he just went, sat in the stands at a football game one, one time, did a, did a recording on a tape, sent it in kind of as a joke. And you get a response saying, Jerry, you need to do this. So wow. it's funny. It's funny how that works, but, um, beyond the, the, the fun story of it, how important is that for people at that point, um, in, in school or just starting off, how important is it for a broadcaster or more, more fully a media type to be multi-talented and not zone in on one thing. Well, I think that's really important today. Oh my goodness. I mean, when I chat with students, I'm, I'm always amazed by how technically savvy they are, which I am not. I'm from a different generation. And really my generation was one where we, if I was in TV, well, what I really wanted to be was a good all round sportscaster. And for me, that meant four skills. That meant reporting, that meant live event, that meant play by play, and that meant hosting. So like a, a sports center or a sports central. So that was my focus on one lane of TV. But today, really, you're content creators on multiple different, different types of platforms. So I think when you can stretch yourself and diversify, then that was important back then and it's even more important now because I'm seeing now, in fact, I'm always amazed how, the, let's say you're, you're covering the hockey game. Well, you're not just covering the hockey game, you're also, now you're also filing an online story. Maybe you're also interviewing some players and posting those clips uh, to the online, right? You're, you're, you're taking an online story and then you're making it a written version of the story. So really writing though, Jonathan, is at the core of our business. And it always has been. Uh, we're always writer, we're always writers first, right? It's research, writing, and then in my case, it would be the presenting of the information. But to diversify, absolutely. Back in the day, Jonathan, we would always joke and say, you know, we're always trying to feed the beast. And they still say that in newsrooms, but I actually think now it's we need to feed multiple beasts. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned the four um, the four concentrations. And you tackled all of them uh, in your time at TSN, uh, just all kinds of different varieties of, of experience there. Um, talk about some of the, 
the differences in say um being a show host of say something like sports center or sports desk um a, as opposed to like you say play by play and and show hosting just how different of a beast yeah. are all those things oh they're they're similar skills but also very very different and if you're talking about tsn i i better share this with you because i think you'll get a kick out of it because we are a visual medium here right jonathan yeah. so uh there it is that's actually my my old huh. tsn jacket i actually still have that and i'm happy to say it kind of still fits <laughs> but uh yeah tsn there's the jacket still exists i think most of us that wore that that old logo that I guess we would say this is the vintage logo now. Uh, I bet you almost all of us still have our jackets. I know Rod Smith does. Um, so doing all those different types of skill sets, it does require different types of preparation. And at the end of the day, it also requires a vast knowledge, right? You, you really have to know the material. And for me, when I started at TSN, I actually started as an editorial assistant. Uh, so I actually started by writing, um, there was a group of us, we were called flugans, which is actually, uh, from what I understand, it's a, a slang word for German housefly. So we were the lowest of low in the TSN newsroom. Uh, we made very little money. We worked very hard. We made long shifts, but we were happy as clams. We were all in our early 20s. And this really gave me an incredible foundation for quickly writing to deadline and writing headlines. So that by the time I went to Winnipeg, where I then actually worked for CTV as a reporter and an anchor, I had this great foundation of writing, writing for television, especially sports highlights and being able to turn them around really quickly. Because if, if, you, don't, if you don't mind, I'd love to share with you, when, when I was in Winnipeg and this was the Jets, the first Jets, we would do that late show, the 11 o'clock show, but you would actually have to run over. Luckily, we were right beside the, the old arena, and you would be banging away, getting your sportscast ready, and then you'd be watching the, the Jets game out of one corner of your eye and with other, other games, banging out your sportscast, and then you would run over to the arena, get the post game from the two teams, the two dressing rooms, then actually we were tasked with putting an impact player of the game on the air, so a little separate sidebar, and then go on the air. And, re and so we were humming, and I, I am so blessed and grateful for that experience in the TSN newsroom, because that's what prepared me for that anchoring job. Now, wow. I just shared that story with you because, I mean, that's what we were doing. That, that was just a normal thing. Uh, so, uh, to be able to diversify, there's where that comes in, to be able to write and to write quickly. And so that's why I always stress to people that are trying to get into our business to take those writing jobs in the very beginning and get as many reps as you can. And that, um, I guess, brings me to the play-by-play -play because the play-by-play -play is a totally different animal, totally different. And... I was very blessed to be given the opportunity to do some play-by-play -play for hockey and for basketball when I was at first at the score. And, and then later when I came out here to, to CTV and did some games for WTSN, CBC, TSN. But I only got about 20, 25 games, maybe if I was lucky in one year. And that is next to impossible to be able to truly master that skill. You need reps. You need so many reps. And so, in fact, at one point, I found myself volunteering in Ottawa. I asked Rogers Cable if I could volunteer to get some reps in. And I was at the score at the time. Because you need names and numbers, names and numbers, and the flow of the game. And you cannot get that, the cadence of your voice. And I was so blessed to be able to um, lean on some uh, giants of our industry. Joe Bowen, the voice of the Leafs, Mr. Cole, uh, Chris Cuthbert helped me a great deal, especially with how I, how he actually would set up his cards, because that's a whole process. Oh yeah. How, and you know that, Jonathan, right? How do you, how do you actually go to the game with what material? What are we looking at here as we're really calling a game in yeah. real time? So basketball, I'll be honest with you, uh, basketball, I found that much easier to, to take on 
uh, and that's just totally because of the the flow of the game, the stoppage, the substitutions. And uh, but I definitely enjoyed the experience. But I've gone on too long here. But really, very different, very different skill sets between reporting, yeah. anchoring, live host, and play by play. So we're um, and we'll take a break here in a few minutes. But I wanted to have a little bit of fun with um, bringing up some of um, some of your best memories from some of the some of the games, some of the moments you've you've been a part of because being in this business um, allows us to be witness and be there for a lot of uh, a lot of cool things. So is there are there some experiences and some games or some memories that that mm. you still look back on like, wow, I was a part of that? Yeah, wow. Well, so many. I mean, when you've been at it for um, that's right, you build so many beautiful memories and uh, I, I think a lot of people always ask me about who is my favorite athlete to interview. And I get that question a lot. So I'll start with just that quick little memory is actually, it's not the, my most, the one that stands out for me the most is actually Stu Hart. So wrestling fans will know who Stu Hart is, you know, um, and his connections to WWF and his sons and the whole family and and I was very lucky to go to the house and do a story for a show that TSN had at the time. John Wells hosted it. It was called TSN Sunday. So I was given a lot more time to tell that story of Stu Hart. And I mean, we had Premier Ralph Klein was in the piece. Owen Hart, Bret Hart were in the piece. And 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 that really stands out to me as a real character. And really, someone should do a movie about his life. Ed Whalen was in it. Um, a big broadcaster here in Alberta, and he was the voice of Stampede Wrestling. So that's actually one of my favorite people that I can remember um, when it comes to athletes. A memorable story or game, I guess, if you will. I've, I've done X Games. I've done pretty much almost every type of sport, and that's why I like the amateur sports because sometimes I learn about things I'd never even heard of, like CPAC TACRA. I guess I always try to find a unique and curious angle to uh, a game or a player, you know, what a player has to say. But the memory before we go to break here would be actually uh, the 1994 uh, Grey Cup in Regina. And this was actually the year that the Baltimore Stallions won the cup and they beat the Calgary Stampeders. And I was actually doing double duty. I was there for ESPN 2 during the game broadcast. And I remember, and it was incredibly windy and they had built these extra um, stands to hold like auxiliary stands. And there was a great deal of concern that these were going to blow over. And, and I can really remember doing that opening hit with, uh, with you know, the commentators from ESPN in my ear. And, and then after that was over, I had to rush over, basically change mics, get my TSN mic, and then cover the losing dressing room of the Calgary Stampeders. And so that one really sticks out for me because it was in Regina, the old stadium. I was double duty. And so that's a big memory. Oh, that's awesome. We can get two, uh, two sportscasters uh, together talking stories. We could go all day. I know, <laughs> I know. That's so much fun. Um, we'll take a break um, and we'll be back uh, for a second segment. Switch gears a little bit, but I'm really excited about our second block where we talk a little bit about Lucy Tries Sports and dive into more of your amateur sports background. We'll be right back here on Behind the Mic on Amateur Sports TV. <music> And back here on Behind the Mic on Amateur Sports TV, visiting with Lisa Bose here for segment number two. A lot of fun in that first block, talking about a little bit about your path 
um, in in sports casting, the beginnings of it, and some of some of the old stories that are always fun to reminisce on. I want to talk a little bit uh, about what you're up to now because um, from what I get from you, you're just ex as excited about what you're doing now as um, what you've done on the sports casting side. Um, your current project is the Lucy Tries Sports Children's Book Series. Tell us about that. Yes, it is. And this is actually, I better do the, uh, you know, the publisher will want me to put that on the screen. Uh, that is our latest title in the series. So there's five books and basketball was the uh, was the latest one that we've released, but I'm working on more. But yes, Jonathan, the whole idea behind the series is that we are trying to obviously reinforce the benefits of sport and reinforce the benefits of being active because the research is very clear that if you start at an early age, if you're active at an early age, then you will have that active life. So I guess you could say that my whole life before this role as a children's book author was forged at the very beginning when I went into phys ed because I really am passionate about you know, encouraging our next generation, our children, uh, to have that happy and healthy life. And we know that they will get that if they can build uh, physical activity into their lives. But the second part that's even more critical, especially now around COVID, is the perseverance and building resiliency in our kids. And we know that right now they are trying so hard trying to wear their masks and trying to learn to read and to write and to do their numbers, um, you know, amidst this, this strange time. So Lucy tries, it's very important that we use the word tries because that's what we're all doing, right? I tried, tried in the very beginning to forge a sports casting career and, and I kept going at it, right? I kept persevering to make that happen. And the same thing with these books, um, it took me seven years and 14 rejections uh, before the first book was was published. It was taken on by, by Orca Book Publishers. Yay, right there in Victoria, BC. <laughs> that's, uh, I've heard that's a nice place, Victoria. <laughs> of course, I'm based out of Victoria now after growing up. Uh, I actually, I'll confess that I like to tell people that uh, I'm from Okotoks. Um, of course, with the the baseball connection there, and you're probably familiar with uh, a little bit about how that town took in the baseball team there that I was involved in. So I like to tell people I'm from Okotoks, but grew up in Calgary and uh, watched you on watched you on CTV for years. Um, but you talk about perseverance and how important is that? Um, I guess there's there's two prongs to that. Um, in the sportscaster context, um, it's not going to be, for anybody, it's not going to be a straightforward path. And so how important is that? We'll start with that one for sportscasters um, to to keep going through, you know, through the, the misfires. Oh, and, yes. And those. Well, I, I think it's it's really important, especially if you are in the public eye. If you're in front of the camera, you can't hide, right? My good friend Craig Colby, he, he says that. In 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 this type of a role, it, it's you can't hide, and so and not everybody is going to like you. Boy, do you ever need to have thick skin? And that's definitely happened to me, and it's happened to all of us. Where uh, I mean, you have your favorites who you like to watch and or you like to listen to. And so you have to have really thick skin and you have to understand that it isn't you. I had to learn that really that lesson. I, I worked extremely hard. Oh my gosh, like really, but worked too hard. Then I have another friend who said to me, you know, you need to work smart, not work hard. And so I've learned that along the way, but you cannot, if someone doesn't like you and says, well, sorry, then you just care, pick up, pick it up, have a moment to cope because we all need to have that kind of grieving process. Losing a job uh, is really about, is a grief, right? It's you're going through a process there. And as a result, you get through that, you pick yourself up and you go get that other job and you just keep going. We have no choice, right? 
There is no choice. You just keep going. And if you really love it, if you really love it, then you will not quit because it's something that's in your soul, right? You you just stay with it. And, and maybe that's, I guess, why I feel so passionate about the Lucy series is that it did take me a while to get to this point with now five books and some of them in, in three different languages. And, and, and yet, and I'm still going because it, it's still a challenge, but maybe that challenging road I had in sports broadcasting has prepared me for this. And so it's much easier. I like to say that we all need to just stand in the ring and like take a standing eight count, right? Take the 10 count. That's what we all do, right? You get, you get hit, you get stunned, you're down on the mat, but you get up. And that's the most incriti- critical point is you get up. And that's what the Lucy series is kind of saying to kids, just keep trying. It might not work the first time, but you just keep trying. And I think it, uh, that's a timely message for where we are right now is everybody's kind of in that spot and in the, in the COVID world, um, having to, to persevere through, through new challenges. And I've been seeing, uh, some of the ways that you've been bringing it, the, the Lucy tries series, uh, virtually to different classrooms and stuff like that. Talk about, uh, some of the ways that you've been able to, to spread the, spread the book around and, and, uh, bring it to kids. Well, I think it's important to note that when COVID hit, I actually lost pretty much my entire revenue, just like so many of you uh, out there. And so at that moment, then it's a moment of, okay, this has happened. This isn't great, but what's the opportunity? We always have to look for the opportunity that has been in front of us. And everyone's been using the word pivot. Yes, I had to had to adapt. We just adapt and overcome. So for me, it was really important uh, that I, I lost. So I because a lot of what I do, right, is speaking, and it's in front of large groups of people. I was very lucky to be with Rogers Hometown Hockey for the last couple of seasons, bringing Lucy tries hockey, you know, to the fan hub and meeting with with families there and signing their books is brilliant. Well, now that's all gone. Schools are gone. So. What do we do? Well, I realized that I needed to switch it up. And so luckily, again, you always look at the skills that you have in whatever job you're doing. And maybe you do go off the path of sports casting or broadcasting or writing, but maybe you have another skill that might work in this industry. And so really what happened, Jonathan, is that the virtual school visits are essentially I've produced because really I was a producer for many years. I'm producing a mini TV show for grades one, two, and three through the Zoom, Google Meets, and Teams platforms. So it wasn't too much of a big shift for me because I'm comfortable uh, looking at the camera, right? Um, So so that's what you do. You really dial down on what is your skill set and then fill the need. My dad always told me, Lisa, whatever you're going to be doing, you really want to just fill the need, identify the need, and fill it. Or some people like to say, solve the problem. What's the solution? And so I knew that schools were gonna be needing content. They needed something, and they needed something for these kids to to get excited about. And so that's what I've tried to do, is fill the need. Uh, Absolutely, that's great. Um, So if people are are interested in the book, where, uh, where can they learn more about it? Oh, well, you, the, the Lucy tries sports series. And, and I just want to add to that. They are for all kids. Yes. It's pretty cool that I think that it's a girl who's the lead character in a sports series, but in that, that also relates, I guess, back to my background. Right. And the thing is, is that she is for all kids. Lucy is for all kids because kids do not see gender. They don't see gender. They don't see color. And we also even have in our basketball book, you can see Brett in his wheelchair. So I'm also wanting to reinforce um, the the value of physical literacy for all kids. And so the Lucy Tri Sports book series, yes, you can find it anywhere books are sold. So in Indigo, Amazon, I like to support the uh, independent bookstores. So there's a beautiful one downtown Victoria, Monroe's. Uh, in Calgary, we have Owl's Nest Books, but 
Yes, anywhere books are sold. You can find them online or even on lucytrysports.com. And then after uh, after the show airs here on, on uh, Friday night, we're pre-recording a couple of days early, but after we air on Friday night, uh, if you want to tweet that out, I'll give you I'll give you a retweet on that and send people there. Oh, um, I would love that. That sounds that sounds great. Us uh, Canadian authors, Canadian creators, we we love that support online because it really does help. And let's face it, publishing bookstores. They have also definitely taken a hit amidst COVID. Absolutely. There's a couple more aspects that uh, I wanted to hit today before uh, before time runs out on us. Um, we, we've uh, talked about it a little bit, um, your involvement and your coverage of youth sports, uh, but there's been one event that you that you've covered for i believe seven years is the blg awards uh for youth sports athletes uh can you tell us more what those are what those are aimed at and how your mm -hmm. your opportunity with it came up well it's interesting because i think most of us know what the heisman is but I would suggest that most Canadians really don't know what the BLG awards are. And now they have actually been reimagined just recently into the Lieutenant Governor uh, Athletic Awards. So they started as the Howard Mackeys, then the BLGs, and now they're the Lieutenant Governor Athletic Awards. And these, are the, these um, awards were the brainchild of Lois and Doug Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell, whose name is on UBC's uh, arena, actually, and he was a commissioner of the CFL. He's, um, you know, very well known in, in, in sports in Canada. And his wife, who just recently was the lieutenant governor of Alberta, so really like a Bill and Melinda Gates of Canada, if you will, and the Mitchells are behind this. And what it is, Jonathan, is it's celebrating the top university student athletes in Canada. And so these awards would go every year in the spring. And I was very lucky and fortunate to be able to do that. Yes, seven years in a row. I even, it was really wonderful. For the first time ever, I worked with Brian Williams, who I grew up watching as a kid on CBC Sports Weekend. And so that was a real thrill. And being able to co-host that with Brian and Vic Router and Glenn Suter. And so it was a neat show because it was a live studio audience but it was also a TV show. So you're playing to the audience on a stage, but you're also looking at a camera. So that was a unique opportunity and one I, I really did cherish and was very grateful for. Uh, so that's what that was. And, and Peter Watts, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention Peter in our conversation here today, uh, a true mentor of mine, and I still miss him. Uh, we lost Peter uh, just over a year ago. Uh, so, yeah, Peter Watts, who, who used to uh, work for U Sports and was a, a big proponent. And I'm very happy to say that working with Pete's family, we have created the Peter Watts Memorial Media Fund. So for any student that is thinking of getting into broadcasting, there is grant money available to them uh, to kind of keep Peter's legacy alive. Yeah, and uh, I knew a little bit about uh, what what Peter had done and and knew that he was really important to a lot of a lot of people there. But uh, if you wanted to take a moment to uh, for people who who maybe didn't uh, haven't been in that you know around Calgary or cross paths with him, what uh, what kind of impact did he make? Well, he actually, if if people want to find out about somebody who really had. His finger, his finger, really, he was, he was a mentor to so many people that all of you would know, but you would not really know about him. And that's kind of the man that he was. But he's a TSN original. So if you, if you research Peter Watts, uh, he was a TSN original. And so I remember him from when I was back in that early TSN newsroom, learning how to be a writer. And, and through my entire life, Peter has been there for me. And so he was a TSN original, and then he came out uh, to Calgary, and for 20 years he did a radio show across Alberta. And so he was, uh, and he was very well, um, really well, just so well regarded and loved by everybody in the broadcasting business. And you'll see quotes from Gord Miller and Scott Moore and 
so many people about what Peter meant to them in their lives. So I, I felt along with some of my other colleagues that it was important that we carry his legacy on, his legacy of journalism, of being correct, of um, really doing the story right, of research and preparation. Peter was so, so much to so many. Oh, that's so good. And um, the, the other aspect um, of your of your career that I wanted to get into was um, you have quite a quite a history and quite a list of, of volunteer experience in different places um, on the sports landscape, and um, that reinforces kind of a theme of what we've been talking about today. Um, of the involvement in amateur sports. And this is kind of similar of, you know, giving back um, to, to places and to causes uh, that need it. Um, I, I just jotted down some notes. Of course, we talk about the, the BLG Awards, uh, but Sport Calgary, uh, the Golf, golf for Girls, uh, Golf uh, Charity Classic, uh, why is it so important for you uh, to give back to, to places? Well, I, I think when we, when we give back, I, I think everybody can make a difference in some small way. It, it, it can be something very simple or something bigger, but we can all, each one of us has it in us to make a difference in someone's life. And, and that's just how I've always lived my life. Uh, you know, and, and everything that I've done is to always think about giving back. And I, I have to say that's probably from my parents and, and, and my brother and, and how we grew up and by extension, their family. And so that's just something that's part of what I've always done. And I think in the, in the golf, uh, that was a, a golf tournament that I ended up handing over to the Canets. And it was really to help uh, women and girls in need in Calgary. Cause I identify going to so many golf tournaments that I have gone to and the big tournaments and big charities, and those are wonderful and they're very much needed for those charities. But then you have the little guy, the little charity that really isn't able to access some of those funds. And so the more you learn, the more you recognize, hey, let's fill a need there. So that's what that golf tournament was about. It was for, uh, for women and girls to benefit from other women who are corporates who wanted to give back. And Sport Calgary really just goes back to my interest in amateur sport right from the very beginning. And because of the Lucy series, I really want to try and get that because, Jonathan, we have a, a, a children's health crisis right now in this country. Uh, and that's, that's just the fact that we have, I think, around 14 percent, only 14 percent, kids age 5 to 11 are getting their recommended activity level every day. And now with COVID, that's dropped to below 5%. So this is a real crisis point. I really think that in many ways, our sports system as well needs to be reimagined. We need to spend more time at the base, at the foundation. Uh, we won't have Olympians and high-performance athletes if we actually don't spend a little bit more time at the grassroots level. Exactly. And I think that's something that, that can sometimes get lost in the in the glamour and the the hype of the 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 major league sports and the Olympic level, what have you at the top level is you don't have that without a commitment to the grassroots level. Yeah, and do you know that in in some Scandinavian countries, they actually I have read, and I, I think this is still correct, so I'll say reportedly, they cycle their elite coaches they cycle their coaches through the system so someone who'd be coaching the world juniors would be cycled through at the bait at the very early stages and work their way back up and and i think that's a, a brilliant thing because we need the top people actually i think at grassroots sport we really have parent volunteers right we and the, and they do a wonderful job too but they're not experts in their field so if we had I think that that system, and you know, I love what Norway did too with the Olympics, right? Where they don't have their their kids playing any competitive until 13, and they were the ones who won the most medals in Norway or in the last Olympic Games in the Winter Games. If that's something that you you know that the system cares about, well, there's an example where they had their children 
just playing for fun. And it was their social piece. It wasn't about about winning that league, right? right. I know it's a big it's a big topic. We'd need many more hours to try to solve <laughs> to talk this through, solve the world's problems here. <laughs> no, it, it's a very valid and a, a very important thing to at least bring up and uh, put into put into discussion. Um, we we referenced the Olympics, and I did want to talk yes. about one one of your highlights here as we kind of start thinking about wrapping up. I thought it would be a little bit. Uh, thought it would be fun to to uh, talk a little bit about the 2010 Olympics um, that you were fortunate to be involved in. Um, host and host and reporter of the Women's Olympic Hockey Tournament in Vancouver. Um, before we talk about how that ended, uh, what do you remember about uh, the Olympic experience? Well, I remember the bowels of UBC Arena there, uh, Doug Mitchell Arena, and I think that's what it's called, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, and, and then at the time, I guess it would have been GM Place, they called it Canada Place, I'm trying to remember. Canada Hockey Place. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I really, that's what I remember, Jonathan, is being mostly in the mix zone, in the bowels of those two hockey rinks uh, for three weeks, and that this was an incredible assignment to be given. I was so blessed to be able to be named to that broadcast crew, highlight of my career for sure. The only Olympics that I ever had an opportunity to work on because it depends on what network you're at sometimes as to who has the rights to the games. So, and to be a home games, wow, what a thrill. Uh, so I remember, yeah, being in the rinks uh, long hours, uh, also trying to find out exactly how to say Happy New Year in Cantonese and Mandarin because at the time, it was Chinese New Year, and so I even got a tiger, I remember, at, the, at, at one point as part of the uh, on-camera. Uh, and I remember, obviously, the excitement. I interviewed uh, Finland's prime minister uh, during the gold medal game. And uh, I remember, though, a lot of the pressure, the pressure to perform. <laughs> 7.5 million people, I guess, were watching uh, that women's game, the, the gold medal final, Canada and the United States. So, but you know what? That's what we live for, right? We live to get the big assignment. And when you're given it, you just got to go for it, make it happen. <laughs> Absolutely. And that was, uh, that was a big moment for sports in the country, having that opportunity to, um, you know, to, re to really uh, make a statement and kind of get bi big and loud with the patriotism, of course. And while we talk about, you know, concentrating on the lower, on the, the grassroots lower levels, um, that's a really important moment there as well um, to not just have that two week party and forget about it, but hopefully use um, big iconic moments like that uh, to help fuel uh, the next wave of interest. Yes, and I think they, they say that they get that Olympic effect. They always talk about that, like the sport of diving, for example. They always get a boost right after a, a summer Olympic Games, right? And we, and we see, and certainly also if you just want to talk to on the women's side, right, that's a, that would have been a, a huge lift for women's hockey at that time. And I know their numbers, their numbers, especially at the peewee age, have always been very strong and they continue to be even stronger after Vancouver. Uh, I don't know if speed skating really saw an uptick as much as they might have liked. Uh, um, but but you're right, though. Those are the moments that inspire our youth and those are the uh, and inspire a nation, right, to be so proud to be Canadian. And I remember actually taking the Canada line into downtown in Vancouver and just a spontaneous moment, a beautiful moment. Everyone just started singing Oh Canada. Uh, we're all just riding the train and then someone just started to sing it. And, and I remember that I get goosebumps actually still thinking about that being on a train with all these strangers and we're packed in like sardines and I'm going to work and they're singing Oh Canada. And it really made you see though how, you know, the value, I guess, and the, the, the power 
uh, of an Olympic Games and especially one in your home country. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, it, it's been goosebumps for me to have the opportunity <laughs> to, to sit and break it down and, and uh, reminisce a little bit uh, with you. Uh, hopefully, uh, our sportscaster types have learned a little bit of something. I'm sure they have. Um, oh, I hope so. Just keep doing it. Just pick, get anything they offer you. I, I should have said this really quickly, Jonathan, yeah. because a lot of people don't know this, but the very first um, on-air job, like everybody usually, they want to do that that side of the of the work but don't forget there's also producing and directing and camera work there's all sorts of things that go in into putting on a show um, but I actually my very first time I was in front of a microphone was for an organ music show so Richard Claterman and his rendition of Billie Jean okay yeah. organ music okay my friends so just take anything that you can and report and learn and get the reps and keep writing, keep content creating. That's a great message. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Um, so My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on and, and, and allowing me to take out my, my TSN jacket that is collecting dust in my closet. There it is. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. All right. Well, I could, I could go for another couple hours, but I think I should probably, probably wrap it up. But uh, Lisa, thanks so much. Thank you, Jonathan, and keep up the great work. I'll send you a few guest ideas. Okay. I would love. I might that. know some people. <laughs> Anything you have, send it over. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Bye bye. We'll go to break. And we'll come back with the wrap up here on Behind the Mic here on ASTV. And once again, welcome back to Behind the Mic here on Amateur Sports TV. We just finished up a chat with Lisa Bose, former TSN Sports Center anchor, host, and reporter at the 2010 Olympics, anchor on CTV Calgary and Winnipeg, all kinds of things. Hopefully, you learned a thing or two. Uh, from her journey and her stories and I know it was a lot of fun for me um, to talk about some of her stories and reminisce it was a lot of fun so once again thank you so much to Lisa Bose for coming on another great guest uh, here on behind the mic you can follow ASTV on social media, all the social media platforms is Amateur Sports TV. Their website, amateursports.tv. And you can find archives of Behind the Mic on YouTube, ASTV's YouTube page. And of course, you can join us every Friday night at 5 Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern for the next edition of Behind the Mic. Next week, we have a fun one coming up. The guest reveal will be on Monday on my on the ASTV Twitter page and Facebook page. Also on my page, if you would like, you can follow me at Haji Speaks, and you can send me a direct message if you have any questions that you would like me to ask our guest. Again, we reveal our guests on Mondays and the show runs on Fridays. Uh, so you have a couple of days uh, to get your questions in. If you would like to, next week is a fun one. We're going live and next Friday night on Christmas Day night and the reveal will come up on Monday. So once again, thank you so much for, for watching. 
and behind the mic with Lisa Bowes this week. This has been Jonathan Hudson for Amateur Sports TV. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again next Friday.